these aren't things I regret doing because I don't. If I had never done them, I would never have known they aren't things I want to do again in my business. Having said that, here are the four things I will never do again in my handmade business. Hey, my name is May and I help makers, artists, and designers make a consistent income selling their handmade products online. I've been in business myself selling my handmade jewelry at tinyhandsonline.com for more than a decade. So I can guarantee you that I've tried almost everything that a business owner can do for their physical product business. One of those things that I'll never do again in my business is craft shows. Now, don't get me wrong. Craft shows are perfect for most makers just starting out. I actually recommend that if you've never sold your product before, and if there are good shows and events near you, that you definitely try your hand at doing a few craft shows. They're actually a really great place for you to validate your products to see if a total stranger would pay you money for what you make. That's the best kind of validation to have. No amount of family and friends who tell you how amazing your products are can ever replace having a total stranger pay you for your work. I have also seen it to be a great place to get feedback on your products, what's working and what's not. All of these things can be really useful information to have when you're working on building up your online side of your business. So I did a ton of craft shows ever since I started Tiny Hands, my jewelry business. Even when I was still in college, living with my family back in Malaysia, I did a few craft shows there. And I even remember once when I had such a terrible day where there was no traffic, I made no sales, and my dad was so supportive that when he came to pick me up after the day was over, he had seen how hard I was working and he ended up taking me out to a nice dinner, just the two of us. But anyway, if you've done craft shows, farmers markets, art shows, festivals, and so on, you know the life. Shows take up so much time and energy, and there's never a guarantee that you'll be profitable. Some people I've read recommend that you should make two to four times back your booth fee. And if you don't, it wasn't a good enough show to keep doing again. And honestly, if you sat down and calculated all the costs it took you to do a show, it very rarely ended up being profitable for me. Like, let me give you a great example. I lived in Minneapolis for many years and for a couple of years, I applied to get into Renegade Craft Fair. They have one in Chicago and if you're not familiar or haven't heard of Renegade, it's a very big, very sought after, in demand craft show. It's juried and it always brings in an amazing roster of vendors and lots of foot traffic as well. And Chicago's a big city. So I paid $500 for my booth fee. I made about $2,000 over the weekend I did the show. But let's start counting all the extra costs and work that had to go into doing the show. I had to pay for accommodation because I wasn't from Chicago. I paid for gas round trip driving from Minneapolis to Chicago. I had my husband and my mom help me out over the weekend. So that's three people total whose time I needed to help me man my booth. That time isn't free, especially when there are other better things, higher ROI things that you can do with that time. I had to pay for food and drink for all three of us over the two days. There's paying for parking, toll fees, wear and tear on your car, not to mention all the extra hours I put in to make inventory leading up to the show. And you know you don't sell 100% of everything you made. And finally, this is something very few craft show people consider but you have to count the cost of goods sold. Just because we made $2,000 in sales that weekend minus the booth fee of $500 doesn't mean we made a profit of $1,500. If we sold 100 pieces of jewelry to make that $2,000 and let's say our cost to make one piece is $5, that's another $500. That's pure cost to pay for materials and supplies and the time it took to make those products. Now we're left with $1,000 in profit, and I haven't even begun to deduct all the other expenses for all the other things I just mentioned. I would be surprised if I had $500 left over of profit from that show. And you know what? That was a good show. I've done my fair share of summer shows, shows where the organizers didn't invest enough resources into marketing the show, 
where there was hardly any traffic and where I didn't even make enough money to cover my booth fee. Doing craft shows can be a huge risk, especially when you haven't done them before. There was actually even one show I did that was great the first year, but the second year, they put me right next to the band, you know, the entertainment for live music that they had. I thought that would have been a good thing because the spotlight would because the spotlight would be on me, right? Nope. <laughs> no one wanted to come close to my booth because it was so loud and it, I could barely talk to my customers. It's just hard to find good craft shows and you can never really know if it's good for you until you try it for yourself. There's so many variables and so much that's out of your control. So I became a lot more selective with what shows I did and even stopped them altogether when I started to see that I had created other streams of income elsewhere that was paying me better money than craft shows. When I wasn't doing shows, I was spending my time building up my online business. I could make more money sitting on my butt in my pajamas, drinking hot chocolate in the comfort of my own home with Gilmore Girls playing in the background than I could hauling myself out in the freezing Minnesota winters making it to a show. On the same topic of shows, before I move on to my second point, I also want to address trade shows, which are shows specifically for buying and selling wholesale. They're not the same as craft shows, yet they have the same value to me at this point, where it's very expensive to do and you get a very low return on your investment compared to other streams of income that I get. By the way, if you are enjoying this video and if you're finding it helpful, please hit the like button, maybe even subscribe if you want more videos like this. When you like or subscribe or leave a comment, it actually tells YouTube that this was a good video and it helps show it to more people on YouTube. Number two, the second thing that I will never do again in my handmade business, and that is paying for SEO services. At some point in your business, you might consider hiring an SEO service professional to do SEO work on your site or on your Etsy shop. I have done this at least three or four times myself, and here's my experience. It's never a good return on investment, and I believe that's because there's the inherent problem that most SEO people don't know your products and your customers the way that you know them. So it's likely they'll make keyword suggestions for you that aren't aligned with who really are the types of people buying your products. I'm not saying you shouldn't concern yourself with SEO, but it's just that I think it's better that you learn to do it yourself first than to hire someone to do it for you. In fact, I will say this about anything and everything in your business. When it comes to doing social media, to pitching your product, selling wholesale, doing paid advertising, always learn how to do it yourself first before you outsource it. So going back to SEO, SEO is a long-term game. So another problem with hiring out for it is you won't see a return on your investment until much later, assuming it was done right to begin with. And to me, I would rather spend my money on other kinds of services like a paid advertising manager or an assistant to help me write pitches to magazine editors because those are the things that I can more directly see a faster money in and money out. SEO takes very long to get any form of feedback that you're doing it right. So when you hire someone to do keyword research and optimize your product listings for you, you won't know how good or bad of a job they did until months or years later. Again, I'm not saying you should never ever hire a professional to do SEO for you, but that there are other lower hanging fruit in your business that you can take advantage of and that your money is better spent on initially before spending that money on SEO. Number three, the third thing I will never do again in my business is taking on custom orders. Again, like craft shows, it's good to do if you're just starting out. I've had some amazing experiences with custom work where in the beginning of my business where it started to take off but I didn't have a full-blown product line yet, I would get emails from people asking me to make specific things that I didn't have in my shop yet. This is great feedback to have because if multiple people are asking for something, you can bet that there are more people out there that will want that same thing. And it's definitely smart to make something that's in demand because it'll be easier for you to make sales. 
Some of my best-selling products now are because of custom orders. And let's look at it this way. In the beginning, at least, a sale is still a sale, right? But I stopped doing custom orders, and I know you can relate to this, but it's mostly because I could never charge how much I really needed to. A custom order for me takes anywhere from two to four weeks of non-stop work to design something new. I spend a lot of time testing colors, matching clay colors with the actual real food that I was asked to make. The trick is, polymer clay, which is what I use to make my jewelry, is a different color before and after it's been cured in the oven. And then there's finding the right textures for sculpting the piece and finding the right fragrance or essential oil, because all my jewelry is scented, so they all smell like what they look like. But not all fragrance oils are created equal. Some can smell really chemically, and some just don't smell realistic enough. The entire process takes a long time. And when people ask for a custom piece, they don't realize all that work that goes into designing something new. So they just expect to pay around the same price as what they see in my online shop, which is $20 to $30 for a necklace. I cannot charge $20 for a custom order that took me three weeks to make. If I did, I would be broke and homeless and I wouldn't be talking to you here today. So what do I do instead? Well, right now, if it's a simple enough modification to an existing design, we can certainly do that. Like, I make a waffle necklace that's got some butter on top, right? If someone asked us to remove the butter, although I can't imagine why they would want us to remove the butter, but that would be no problem at all. So we do take it in a case-by-case -case basis, depending on what the customer wants. But for totally new designs, I now tell people that I can certainly and am happy to do a custom design for them, but I, that I do require a minimum amount of 100 pieces of that design for it to be worthwhile for my time. This does turn most people off unless it's a brick and mortar who, or online brand who wants to resell this custom design to their own audience. So this is my nice way, my nice way of saying yes, but no. Finally, the number four thing I will never do again in my handmade business. Can you guess what it is? Write a comment below with your guess on what you think it is. I'm going to give you a few seconds. Maybe while you're at it, start thinking also about things you'll never do again in your business, okay? So the last thing is blogging. Again, like with all the other stuff, it's not that I'm saying it's bad because blogging was hugely instrumental with Creative Hive, which is this business that we're on now where I'm sharing with you marketing tips for your own business. But let me set the record straight. Blogging is only really good for people who are in the space of education, or if your business has some element of education in it, or if you're a service provider or coach. If you sell a physical product like clothing or jewelry or candles, it's really hard to make blogging work for you. I used to blog a lot for my jewelry business and I even hired a virtual assistant to write blog posts for me too. I went all in. I did blog posts featuring other cool food related products, blog posts on food recipes, on how to style or wear my jewelry along with outfit inspiration posts. And while I did get some traffic from it, that traffic hardly converted into sales. And it's not because I didn't funnel that traffic over to my shop. No, with every blog post I wrote, I always made sure that we reconnected or tied it back to one of my products somehow. And my blog was sitting directly on my website too. It wasn't some separate domain name where it was difficult for people to come over to my shop. Ultimately, it just ended up being a marketing strategy that had very low ROI, and there are other better marketing I could do that was more profitable. Unless you're naturally a great writer or you love writing, like maybe it's cathartic for you, I don't usually suggest physical product business owners take on blogging. It's time consuming to do, but more than that, you also now, in this day and age, because of all the competition, you need to promote your blog posts if you want traffic and people to come over to read those blog posts. And the way I see it, if you're already spending the time to promote something, why promote the blog post that promotes the product when you can just directly promote the product <laughs> and just shorten that process and save you time, right? 
You know, the people that are out there who are telling you to blog are people who are talking to coaches and service providers. As I mentioned before, you might be able to consider blogging if you have some sort of educational element to your business. Like, say you make skincare or say you make children's clothing and you want to share with your audience everything you know about raising a family, like kids' pastime activities, kid-friendly and fun recipes for dinner time. Most of us have products where we can't naturally do that in a way that serves our customers first. So I would say, don't even concern yourself with blogging for now. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to my channel, leave a comment too if you have any questions. I will see you in that next video. If you found this video helpful, stay on to watch this next video on the screen. I only share and talk about things that I know will help you in your handmade business. So I'm confident this next video will help you too.